Hello and welcome back to another Byzantine video on our channel No Budget Films. This video will be our 700 subscribers special, and as a way to celebrate this milestone, we will be going over 10 literary works from the Byzantine Empire, which I consider to be my top 10. The Byzantines now have for sure created numerous amounts of literary works from books to illuminated manuscripts, and even epic poetry. But since there's just so much material written by the Byzantines during their time, we will have to narrow it down for this video, and thus here we will cover what I think are the 10 best literary works published by the Byzantines during their time. Now, in order for these works to qualify for this video, they have to be strictly published during the era of the Byzantine Empire from the 4th to 15th centuries AD, and must be strictly written by a Byzantine author, and therefore not something written about the Byzantine Empire from a foreign writer. This video thus will not be one about books on the Byzantine Empire by modern authors. That will simply be another video for another time. In this video now, I will be ranking the Byzantine era books from 10 to 1, with 1 being my top choice, all while the books we will go over here will be very varied going from epic poems such as the Alexiad and the Song of the Genes Akritas, to military manuals such as the Strategicon and illuminated manuscripts like the Madrid Skelitsis. So without further ado, let us proceed to the list. But of course, before we begin, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to our channel as your support really helps in growing it. Known by its Latin title De Ceremonis, although written in Greek, this book is the ultimate guide to Byzantine court culture and protocol, especially in the 10th century wherein it was written. This book now was written or at least commissioned by the court ceremony obsessed scholar emperor Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus, probably from 956 to 959. I consider De Ceremonis to be part of my top 10 Byzantine era literary works, as it is the ultimate guide to the court culture of the Byzantines, which goes into very much detail about life in the imperial court of Byzantium. Here, its author, the emperor Constantine VII, goes over how the court should behave in religious and secular festivals, during races and military triumphs in the Hippodrome, coronations, and when foreign ambassadors come to Constantinople. Additionally, this book also gives us a look on what outfits were worn by Byzantine emperors and their respective courts, as well as how the palace buildings of Constantinople looked like. This book, simply known as the Chronicle of John Malalas or the Chronographia, was written by the said John Malalas, a 6th century Byzantine Syrian historian from Antioch, who later lived in Constantinople. This chronicle consists of 18 books, although today its beginning and end are lost, but we know that in its present state, the book begins with the mythical history of Egypt and ends in 563, shortly before the death of the great and influential Byzantine Emperor Justinian I. This book now makes it to this top 10 list of mine, as it is certainly a very valuable source on the early history of Byzantium in the 5th and 6th centuries, which goes over not only the well-recorded reign of Justinian I, but of his immediate predecessors as well, such as Justin I, Anastasius I, Zeno, and Leo I, and thus giving us a clear image of what circumstances Byzantium had back then, which led to its golden age under Justinian. Aside from giving us a clear picture of the early centuries of Byzantium, I would consider this work to be in my top 10, as it was also written in a very simple way for commoners to understand, which thus gives us an idea of how common people in the early centuries of Byzantium communicated and lived, something not very common in other Byzantine sources. Although many remember the 6th century historian Procopius of Caesarea for writing the highly biased secret history, this more reliable and important source in early Byzantine history is the history of the wars. Just like the Chronicle of John Malalas as mentioned earlier, Procopius' history of the wars discusses events in the earlier parts of Byzantine history and is more detailed than Malalas' chronicle. Now, Procopius of Caesarea was a Byzantine Greek historian from the 6th century as well as a government official in the court of Emperor Justinian the Great and the secretary of the well-known General Belisarius, who Procopius accompanied in his campaigns, thus making his works an eyewitness account to these events in Byzantine history. For being something written by someone who personally witnessed the events in Byzantine history from wars to everyday life, I consider this to be part of my top 10 Byzantine era works, though also for the reason of it being a highly extensive account on the early years of Byzantine history. Procopius's history of the wars now consists of eight books, with the first two on the Byzantine Sassanid Wars during Justinian I's reign, the next two on Justinian's North African campaign and the conquest of the Vandal Kingdom by his general Belisarius, and the final four on the Byzantine reconquest of Italy from the Ostrogoth Kingdom, which ends in 553. 
The 11th century was surely one of the most challenging and exciting times in Byzantine history, and no other source goes over it in a very detailed way than Michael Selos's Chronographia. Now, Michael Selos was not only an 11th century Byzantine Greek historian, but a philosopher, politician, and even a music theorist who personally witnessed the reigns and administrations of several emperors from 11th century Byzantium. Selos's Chronographia now covers the reigns of 14 Byzantine rulers beginning with Basil II in the late 10th century and ending with Michael VII Ducas in the 1070s, thus practically covering 100 years of history. Due to Selos witnessing the reigns of some emperors he wrote about, his book is therefore structured in the form of biographies, while it also goes over several military and political events such as major battles and countless court intrigues in Selos's own point of view. For being a great source that gives us a clear picture of the Byzantine world in the turbulent yet eventful 11th century, from the point of view of someone who witnessed said events himself, this book therefore makes it to this top 10 list. Now if Michael Selos' Chronographia is the best place to go for 11th century Byzantium, Niketas Koniatis' Historia is the one for Byzantium's 12th century story. Niketas Koniatis, other than being an eyewitness historian to the events of the late 12th and early 13th century Byzantium, was also a government official who personally served in the courts of emperors, which thus makes him a valuable source to the events of his time. Koniatis' Historia now covers events in the Byzantine Empire from 1118 to 1207, therefore going over a long period of time an event such as the reigns of the Komnenos emperors John II, Manuel I, Alexios II, and Andronikos I, as well as the reigns of the Angelos emperors beginning 1185 with Isaac II and then Alexios III. Additionally, Koniatis' Historia gives us a full and vivid account on the tragic sack of Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade in 1204 and the temporary collapse of the Byzantine Empire, though his work unfortunately ends in 1207 with Byzantium in exile as the Empire of Nicaea where Koniatis himself fled to and died in 1217. As our main source for the exciting and tragic story of Byzantium in the 12th century and early 13th, Koniatis' work therefore makes it to this top 10 list. Here's another literary work by the scholarly emperor Constantine VII from the 10th century, who as mentioned earlier wrote the De Ceremonis, which was basically on court ceremonies. This one, however, which is again known to us in Latin as De Administrando Imperio, or simply DAI, is our ultimate guide not to Byzantine court ceremony, but to imperial administration as well as domestic and foreign policy. Although it is known to us by its Latin name, its original name in Greek actually meant to my own son Romanos, as the Emperor Constantine VII who wrote it intended it to be a manual for running the empire for his son, the future Emperor Romanos II and his successors. Now DAI was written between 948 and 952 when Constantine VII ruled as sole emperor and it is divided into four sections with the first part on foreign policy with the dangerous northern nations, the second one on diplomacy when dealing with these said northern nations, the third one on the history and geography of the nations around Byzantium, and the last part on the politics and organization of the Byzantine Empire itself. To put it short, DAI is more or less a guide not only to Byzantium's complex politics, history and organization, but to that of Byzantium's neighbors such as the Arabs, Lombards, Venetians, Serbs, Croats, Magyars, and Pechenegs, which therefore makes this book a valuable source to learn about the world around Byzantium in the highly eventful 10th century. As DAI is a highly valuable source to help us understand the world of the Byzantines in the 10th century in a very detailed manner, I consider it to be part of my top 10 Byzantine literary works. Although written in the 12th century by the Byzantine historian John Skelitsis and produced in the Norman court in Palermo, Sicily, the Madrid Skelitsis Chronicle extensively covers the history of Byzantium from the 9th to 11th centuries, featuring 574 illustrated miniatures. Now, as the medieval era was known for numerous illuminated manuscripts, this is perhaps the most famous Byzantine one, and it surely does have a lot to show, from imperial coronations to everyday life, and from intensive battles to daily tasks done by emperors and the imperial court. This illuminated manuscript now covers events in Byzantine history beginning in 811 with the death of Emperor Nikephoros I and then proceeding into the rise of the Amorian dynasty in 820, the rise of the Macedonian dynasty in 867, the glorious Byzantine victories and tragic defeats during the 10th century, the long reign of Basil II, and finally ending with the end of the Macedonian dynasty with the deposition of Emperor Michael VI in 1057. Certainly, the Madrid Skelitsis covers such a long range of years in Byzantine history 
and more so it gives us literally a clear picture of life during those years in Byzantine history through the illustrations. And it is for this reason alone why I put the Madrid Skeletus as one of my top choices in this list. Today this highly valuable manuscript is housed in the Biblioteca Nacional de España in Madrid, Spain, which is why it is known to us as the Madrid Skeletus. The Song of Tigenes Akritas is often regarded as the only surviving epic poem from the Byzantine Empire, while it is also considered Byzantium's national epic as it reflects both Byzantium's type of literature, but also their culture and military values of chivalry, loyalty, and learning to put aside differences for the good of the empire. If England has the Arthurian legends, in ancient Greece, the Iliad and Odyssey, the Byzantine Empire has the Akritic songs, wherein the Song of Tigenes Akritas is the most famous of them. Now the Song of the Genes Akritas tells the tale of the heroic deeds of the half-blooded warrior Basil, who is a Byzantine Greek on his mother's side and an Arab on his father's side. Hence he is known in Greek as the Genes Akritas, meaning the two-blooded border lord. Although it is not known where this epic poem was written, its setting is more or less early 10th century Byzantium, during the time when the Byzantines have been gaining the upper hand against the Arabs in the east. Although the story itself does not exactly show its half-blooded hero Basil battle the Arabs, but rather his exploits in fighting wild animals, bandits, and even a dragon, while it also shows him kidnapping a woman who he eventually marries just as his father did with his mother. Confusingly, the Song of the Genes Akritas has many versions, but I still consider it to be part of my top 10 literary works from the Byzantine Empire, simply because it clearly shows Byzantium's culture in the form of epic poetry, the way most nations showcase their culture. Part of the many literary works left behind by the Byzantines is the military manual known as the Strategicon, which is attributed to the Emperor Maurice in the late 6th century, and was either written by the Emperor Maurice himself or by his brother Peter as a codification of the military reforms of Maurice and based on the experiences of the army in his time. This military manual now is perhaps the most detailed guide to Byzantine military tactics during the 6th and 7th centuries. And not only does it explain the Byzantine art of war, it also discusses the fighting styles and behavior of Byzantium's neighbors and enemies during that time such as the Persians, Avars, Slavs, Lombards, Franks, and Turks. The Strategicon now is divided into 12 books containing information in battle formations and cavalry tactics, what to do in ambushes, baggage trains, strategies generals should consider when fighting particular enemies, strategies for surprise attacks, and last but not least, tactics used by foreign enemies as the Strategicon surely shows military genius especially back in a time when gathering intelligence on the enemy was much more difficult than it is today. I simply have to put it at second place on this list, as first place goes to a literary work that I personally enjoy. And now my number one pick for this list, the Alexiad, perhaps the greatest action epic in the history of the Eastern Romans and certainly the one true exciting action epic story written by the Byzantines that surely shows they have a culture of writing epic tales. What's even more surprising about the Alexiad is that it was written by a female author being Anna Komnene, daughter of the Byzantine Emperor Alexios I Komnenos, thus showing that the Byzantines even had a female historian. The Alexiad which is divided into 15 books specifically focuses on the reign of the great emperor Alexios I, beginning with his rise to power in 1081 before battling the Normans, how he dealt with the Empire's enemies such as the Pechenegs and Seljuk Turks, as well as with conspiracies within the Imperial Court, his dealings with the First Crusade, and ending with his death in 1118. Additionally, the Alexiad also gives us the Byzantine perspective to the events of the very well-known First Crusade, its leaders and objectives, while it also gives us a deep dive into what the Byzantine world was like at the challenging times of Alexios I Komnenos. Although written in a highly biased way in favor of Alexios, portraying him as somewhat superhuman and all his enemies as evil, it is still a very valuable literary work which gives us a taste of Byzantine literature. It is simply for the reason of being an impressive example of Byzantine literature not only written by a female author, but something that shows us that the Byzantines also wrote exciting epics instead of boring history books to why I consider the Alexiad to be my top pick on this list. This is about it for this list of my top 10 Byzantine literary works. Of course, there are so much more literary works written during the Byzantine era to cover, but that will be too much for one video. To put it short though, the Byzantines were surely a literate, educated, and sophisticated society for them to publish these said books that contain such information and excitement, and it is for this reason to why I chose to make a video on it. 
Now, I hope you enjoyed this video, and please let me know if you agree or disagree with this list through the comments below. And of course, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Once again, thank you all for watching and have a good day.